And then uh, we have the uh, southeast going functions, psi ij, with the indices placed in the same way as here, going from the composite context ti um, plus gamma ij, and since gamma ij is a context over ti, they form a new context, and we can speak about contextual mappings to t of i plus j. So now I'm using this uh, plus notation uh, that I have here. If you don't like the plus notation, you can use a multiplicative notation there instead. Uh, just write ij. It's even, even shorter. Uh, so now it comes, without any three dots anywhere, the recursion equations uh, that uh, uh, these data have to satisfy. And that's um, the functorial law, they look like the functorial laws for a functor. And <coughs> in a while, I should try to explain what functor that is. So first of all, uh, gamma naught is the empty context. And uh, gamma i plus j has the initial part gamma i, followed by the rest, uh, which is gamma i j composed with psi i. And you, if you look at the types of the ingredients there, you can type check that uh, by yourself. And uh, that composition is, uh, of course, defined by the law that I've shown here. That defines composition simply. And then uh, we have the corresponding psi function, uh, <coughs> psi upper i, from gamma i into ti. Uh, so that's the uh, trivial uh, starting uh, basis for the recursion. We just forget about that. <coughs> but then comes now uh, the equation which uh, shows how uh, psi with an upper index is composed out of these uh, psi functions. And that equation, uh, which one also has to type check, of course, uh, is nothing but the Lauritsen equation uh, written out in the new notation. Um, so my i plus j there is uh, Lauritsen's n plus m. And uh, the gamma there is uh, x1 up to xn, and the delta there is uh, xn plus 1 up to xn plus n. And then uh, um, there are the corresponding equations. Um, so uh, that was another <coughs> Samson's question here. It seemed that I had forgotten the composition of two arrows. Uh, and same situation here. You have to write uh, these equations also locally and not only globally. And uh, then they look, uh, of course, slightly more complicated, but in substance uh, it's the same and impossible to take in, um, with all, at least if you want to type check it. You see, type checking this is a non-trivial matter, and uh, I have done the type checking here, but there is no chance of going through it right now. So enough to say that uh, together with these global equations, which are just the Lauritsen equations, there are local forms of it, which uh, Lauritsen <coughs> uh, omitted or forgot, uh, because um, if you remember in his equation, you have psi sub m, sub n sub m, sub n m. Of course, those also have to be defined recursively, and not just the tn functions. And that's what goes on in, uh, in these local equations here. So I will put those aside now. But uh, the important thing is that I'm now um, written up in closed form the equations defining this whole uh, infinite structure. And uh, that poses uh, the following question. I mean, what is it that is uh, shown pictorially in the diagrams 
and defined properly by the equations. And uh, it's clear that uh, it's a two, in some sense, a two-dimensional <coughs> structure. Just looking at the diagrams, we read diagrams. It's a two-dimensional structure. But uh, category theoretically, it is not a two, not as simple as a two-category. It's something else. And uh, my answer to this is that uh, it's a factor from the indexing category to the category of statistical spaces. So now I'm, for the first time, using the term statistical space, which struck me as very convenient. I mean, if we use sample space as usual for the capital gamma, uh, and now if we have not only a sample space, but a sample space with a statistic on it, <coughs> Uh, which was the starting point of the work that I did on these matters around 1970, then why not call that simply a statistical space? So, uh, gamma together with this uh, statistic phi gamma d t uh, is a statistical space. So, uh, a factor from the indexing category to the category of statistical spaces, that means that I have to tell you what is this category of statistical Spaces. When its objects are precisely statistical spaces, <coughs> but to define the category, I have to give the morphisms also. And now I'm using uh, this uh, peculiar formulation of categories. So uh, it's enough to define what an outgoing arrow from this object is, which is the same as defining what a statistical space over this statistical space is. And by definition, uh, that is allowed to now depend on only on T here. So um, in statistical terms, it's like having T as a sufficient statistic, so to say, uh, because uh, we, only we only retain in memory the value of T, that's all we have. So any further uh, in the future we can only depend on T. So if these are, are the objects and these are the arrows, then I have to define uh, what the result of starting from an object, going via that arrow, I should get to a new object. And uh, that's obtained in this way, where uh, the uh, new statistic here, which I call psi phi, is defi properly defined by this equation here. So psi phi applied to gamma delta uh, typed in, in this way is simply defined to be psi applied to phi gamma paired with uh, delta. And uh, uh, there is uh, analogously to this, if you have two arrows, you also have to compose them, and that's what is given in the last equation. I want to show this in a, in a diagrammatic form. Uh, these two definitions, in, they look like this in a diagrammatic form. So you have the, uh, the statistical space here together with the statistical space over it, which uh, I only took to be this a moment ago. But of course you have uh, an obvious projection here, so this is actually a span in categorical terms, and uh, you have to define what the new statistical space is, and that comes out as this arrow. And similarly, if you have two arrows and compose them, uh, it's like span composition in categories, so they are composed into this span. Um, so that uh, finishes the second part of, of my talk. Uh, remains the third part, functional causal models. Well, that's a reference to Judea Pearl. Uh, his big book on causality from the year 2000, uh, in which he... Um, well, it's easy to explain to statisticians <coughs> what is it that he has done. Well, he has reintroduced the notion of causality into statistics 
which we have carefully and with a lot of labor learned to free ourselves from at uh, Carl Pearson's instigation uh, in the 1910s roughly. We have since then all learned not to speak about causality but only about uh, correlations. And uh, of course, um, normal ordinary people have gone on to speak about causes of events and physicists have gone on to speak about causes. Uh, so the notion of causality has proved to be stronger uh, than what uh, Pearson thought. Uh, and uh, now, indeed, we have it reintroduced into statistics in the form of what he calls functional uh, causal models. Now they are, uh, uh, you, uh, Perl deals only with, fi with finitely many uh, uh, quantities, which means that he doesn't have this problem of defining the whole infinite structure, but uh, the finite structure is easily enough uh, to be, it, it's defined by a set of equations, which he calls structural equations, uh, and uh, xi are the causally related quantities, and the, the uis, it's u for unobserved, I think, uh, are the uh, errors. We could call them epsilon sub i in standard probabilistic uh, notation, uh, as an error or a disturbance. And uh, pa of ai should just be read the parents of xi. So they are the finitely many quantities uh, which xi is causally dependent on. And this is simply the uh, whole to see from uh, an example. So a standard example used by Perl himself is uh, this one. Uh, I think you understand it without any explanation on my part. Except that uh, these unobserved errors, they are um, left out of Perl's diagrams. So it's entirely in terms of the x quantities, the x variable here, which means that there is a, an incoming causal arrow from ui to xi uh, at all nodes also. They are not shown. Well, that means that in this particular example, the structural, the structural equations reduced to five equations like this. Um, and uh, now if you compare this with uh, uh, Lauritsen's uh, equation, you see that this is nothing but uh, uh, Lauritsen's equation generalized to the case where uh, each, quant each variable xi is dependent not on a single uh, preceding, causally dependent on a single preceding, preceding variable, but on arbitrary finitely many preceding variables. So that means that the Lauritsen had the same equation in the particular case when you have a linear cause causal structure uh, and it's just the generalization uh, to the more complicated, to an arbitrary causal structure uh, that is the novelty in the first formulation of it. And moreover, the correspondence with my notation is shown here. So Perl's unobserved errors, they are my x's, and uh, Perl's quantities x1 up to xn are my t1 up to tn, or Lauritsen's t1 up to tn. But otherwise it's the same. So the outcome of this is that uh, Perl's functional causal models are the same as the structure that I have described here and with so much labor uh, generalized to the infinite case which uh, requires inevitably some category theory uh, to my mind. Thank you.
and uh, to achieve what you have in mind here, uh, it seems to me that a non-standard approach uh, might be good because uh, you get from uh, from an ordinary coin tossing random walk to a ground motion by letting the step become infinitesimal and uh, but then um, the original ground the original random walk has a discrete time anyway so um, yeah, that would be a big project <laughs> going to that well, it seems like categorically nothing there's nothing that's only about certain modernisms that's why I thought of it Oh, it's the uh, bringing in the continuum, uh, continuous indices, which is the big step. Okay, I think we should stop here and thank Per again for his talk.